Great, so let's get started and uh, as, as we always do at La Scuola, we want to reward good behavior. So thank you so much for showing up on time uh, and welcome everyone. Sure, um, video. So as, as Danny said, please mute yourself um, if you haven't done so already so that we don't get any background noise so that Dr. Bazu can uh, start, you know, when he start his presentation. Uh, so uh, again, uh, Sanjay, uh, thank you so much for doing this again for La Scuola. Um, I, I'm here, I have the, the pleasure and the honor to introduce you again. Um, so I think the most imp important uh, title that Sanjay holds is uh, as a father of uh, Krish Babaria, first grader at La Scuola. So I, I will start with the important things. And you should also know that he serves as the director of research at the Center for Primary Care at Harvard Medical School and director of research at, also at, at Collective Health. Um, he graduated from MIT, uh, was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. Um, you know, I will not uh, get into the Oxford-Cambridge thing right now, Sanjay, but we can have the conversation at a different time. And, uh, and then he was also, uh, he completed a PhD at uh, Yale University and is now uh, doing his res res residency at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, so he's a uh, and, and very accomplished, um, you know, uh, obviously a scientist and an expert and, uh, and again, a valued member of our community who has kindly agreed to educate all of us really for the whole summer, not just now, on how to best deal with what's coming our way every day. As you know, there is a, a COVID-19 task force that uh, has been uh, supporting the school since the beginning of this. And you should know that actually uh, Dr. Bazo has, has agreed to serve on that and he has been doing so for some time. And uh, is also very, always very available to me and Danny when we have questions. So thank you again and uh, give you the floor because people are here to listen to you, not me tonight. Thank you, I really appreciate that. Um, first, I'll begin with an apology. This is the current state of my house. So if you hear screaming children, uh, meowing cats or other unexpected animals, uh, I'll beg forgiveness. Uh, but there's a lot of things that we hope to go over in the next 45 minutes or so, leaving some time for questions. And then we'll also have additional time for uh, questions to the school reps, including Valentina and Danny, with regard to specific questions that may have to do with logistics or classroom specific items that I wouldn't know. So what I hope to be able to cover today, the current update about the epidemiology of COVID and SF with a particular focus on, on kids, of school age, um, looking at some of the school reopening experiences in other locations and how that has informed San Francisco's plans and processes. I'll try to go into some detail about what uh, parents should expect their children to go through given the Department of Public Health requirements. Uh, should you choose to go back to in-person learning, that includes some timelines, some changes in the way pickup, drop off, in-classroom experiences will work, uh, check-ins and so on. I'll give an update on some of the epidemiology of COVID among kids, particularly in the K to eight setting, uh, testing and some updates on testing resources and some discussion around flu season and COVID vaccination. So that's a mouthful. Let me start off with where we are now. This is the uh, daily case rate of COVID uh, in San Francisco. Sanjay, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, sorry to interrupt, but could you um, reshare your screen? I don't think we're all seeing it quite yet. Oh, I'm so sorry. Here, let's okay. see if this. Thank you. Um, Let's try it from here. Can you all see that? Thank you, that works. So this is the general outline. State of COVID and SF, reopening experience and plans, some epidemiology, some testing resources, and some items for vaccination. So here's the graph. Uh, new cases of uh, COVID in San Francisco daily tracked from the beginning of the epidemic, as you'll see that we had the uh, surge you all know about in uh, late July and early August, and since then have been downtrending pretty consistently. Overall, over this entire period of time, we have 91 deaths in San Francisco. Um, those are disproportionately among elderly individuals. Um, as of uh, to date, there are no children who have died of the disease. But you'll see that among the less than 18-year-old crowd in terms of actual positives, um, there have been about 12%. There's a very large slew of 25 to 30 year olds who have 
uh, gotten the disease. They are also disproportionately uh, Latino populations who are working, um, essentially not able to shelter in place, but still working in many essential roles during this time. And although you'll see the case count decline with age, the death rate essentially has the opposite effect of deaths increasing with age. There's a slight male predominance, which is true in general and, and thought to be related to TSL response differences among men and women. In terms of neighborhoods, the disease has been concentrated heavily in the southeast corner of the city and also correlated heavily with poverty. Bayview Hunters Point is the most affected in terms of cases per 10,000. Uh, followed by the 10 to 1. If you don't see your neighborhood listed here, it's further down as one of the less affected neighborhoods with less than 100 cases per uh, 10,000 residents and with no deaths. Um, and so far this has continued pretty much on pace throughout the entire course of uh, the epidemic. In terms of deaths, uh, Asians predominate among the deaths, particularly uh, it's thought because of the older age group. Almost all of these folks who are um, above the age of 70, most actually above the age of 80. And so you see the deaths by age overall um, trending in, in concordance uh, with age-related susceptibility to death. Um, thankfully, no deaths among kids. In California, generally, there have been three deaths among uh, kids 5 to 18 years old, none among those uh, less than five. Among all three, they unfortunately had very serious um, chronic conditions of so cystic fibrosis in two cases, and another case, a severe immunocompromising condition. And COVID was among several uh, infections that they simultaneously had, unfortunately. Um, in the country overall, um, oh, excuse me, one more slide about San Francisco before I talk about the country overall. In terms of the COVID testing rate, we've held steady around 4,000 tests daily. Um, there's a mix of sites. Uh, this is a mix of about half of those being from the City Test SF sites that you see around uh, tented parking lots, and the rest being from various hospitals, urgent care centers, as well as at home testing sites uh, being mixed in. And our test positivity rate has consistently remained uh, below 3%. The general uh, guidance from the federal side has been less than 10% for opening schools, although that's not considered um, strict guidance. Among uh, the epidemiology crowd, uh, the guidance has been trying to keep it less than 5% before opening schools, and we've generally uh, been there since uh, late May, thankfully. Also, to give you a bit of context, in terms of our population incidence, how many people are getting uh, infected per day, we're around six and a half. And to give you a scale of reference, um, in Georgia, where you see uh, schools reopening, having problems, particularly with high school populations, getting large outbreaks, they're actually off the y-axis chart here above 38. Um, so when we talk about relative uh, inequality within the United States in this infection, it's really a, a number of countries in one country. And uh, we're way at the low end, uh, thankfully, in terms of our incidence at this point. Um, even when you compare the Bay Area and San Francisco specifically to some of the regions of um, the Central Valley and some parts north, those areas are also sometimes of this critical range. In terms of the infection rate, we usually talk about a number called the basic reproductive number or the, repro or the effective reproductive number. Um, the basic reproductive number says, how many secondary cases do you get for each case if there's nothing going on in terms of infection control? And for COVID, that number is uh, thought to be uh, around three and a half. What is the effective reproductive number is how many cases are you getting with the current control measures in place? And you want to see that fall below one um, because that means you're doing a good enough job that each case is producing less than one secondary case. And so the epidemic will hopefully die out. Um, we've thankfully uh, continued to remain below one. This is the most conservative projection. Most of the other projections are a bit lower, um, but even by the most conservative projection, we continue to be below one in the city, um, which is also good news. To give you a perspective of where that is across the United States, these are the state numbers where each vertical bar is a different state. California is way over here on the best end, where overall as a state, the estimate is about 0.8 cases for each um, each additional case in the spectrum of the state estimates go from about 0.65 to about 0.95. Uh, 
um, you can see those on the other end are, are often really quite elevated above the, the one marker, uh, unfortunately. Here's a critical point that I hope to make, which is um, how the death rates from COVID uh, sh are shaped dynamically by age. So across all different age groups, um, this is how many people are die have died of COVID. This is how many deaths from pneumonia. And this is how many deaths from the flu, even though it hasn't been flu season officially yet, there's still plenty of flu cases. And what you'll see is for the, for the younger kids, so under one to at least age uh, 14, and to some extent for the 15 to 24 year olds as well, the number of COVID cases, uh, excuse me, the number of COVID deaths is far less than the deaths from pneumonia or even still from flu, even though it's not yet even flu season. That completely reverses then among older populations where the number of COVID deaths vastly uh, outweighs the number of deaths from pneumonia or from flu so far. And so it's important to understand the biology of COVID in this case. COVID enters in part through these ACE2 receptors in the respiratory tract, which uh, don't express themselves at high amounts in childhood. Around age 10 to 14, people start to upregulate that expression. And by the time they're in, in high school, around the high school age is where you have an adult level of those ACE2 receptors that are hijacked by the coronavirus to produce COVID-19. That explains some of the differential susceptibility of kids relative to adults in terms of being infected, uh, their risk of being infected upon exposure. So in terms of that relationship to childcare um, openings, we have uh, accumulating data from around the country in terms of how people have done in terms of the success or failures of opening childcare. This doesn't only include schools, but has also included some daycare facilities. Perhaps the largest study from within the country has taken place in Rhode Island, where essentially the entire state was carefully prospectively studied. Uh, Rhode Island reopened childcare and actually included an extended age so that um, kids who would normally be considered like first or second graders were also eligible for some childcare facility entry. And of the almost 19,000 kids um, thankfully, only 11 uh, experienced infection. The maximum cluster because they were doing potting was the, of five cases. Um, you'll notice the higher susceptibility though for teachers and parents. In Georgia and Maine, there's perhaps the most common contrast. I assume everyone's heard of the Georgia camp disaster, as we often refer to it, where kids were not masked. Some of the staff members were masked. Uh, they we're staying overnight in 15 person cabins, but some of the times the occupancy was up to 24 in those 15 person cabins. And the community rate was off the charts in terms of just the baseline rate of COVID among the general population. It was higher than that Y axis I showed. Maine, by contrast, um, had people sign a kind of a, a testament to staying sheltered in place within the state prior to sending their kids to. Um, the camp, they had mandatory masks for adults, they had testing. I'll talk about kid testing in a moment. And um, they had cohorting of less than 20, distancing and a low community rate and had no cases of um, actually a larger population of kids staying in overnight camps. So I think the, the bottom line is really that our risk or the risk to children is partly driven by their relative risk, you know, not having the ACE2 receptors, having a different immune response means that at least those who are less than high school age tend to be of lower susceptibility, but it's a relatively lower susceptibility. If you're multiplying that relative fraction by a tremendously high community transmission rate, you'll still get plenty of kids infected. If, however, we can maintain a low community transmission rate, then we can maintain low risk for kids overall and benefit from that lower relative risk that they have. So this is in terms of the uh, risk to kids, but of course it's also about teachers and parents in the broader community and what the risks of opening schools may involve. Um, this is a map accumulated of all the school related or campus related um, outbreaks um, across the country. You'll see that of course it concords very well with the overall community rate of disease transmission and there are some cases in California, so let me discuss those in some more detail. Washington State is removed due to some pending lawsuit about the privacy associated with those cases, just like that. 
So uh, in California of schools that have reopened, there have been 24 um, cases, 15 among students and 29 among staff. One older adult, unfortunately, with some chronic disease uh, did die. In the overall group of uh, schools that had reported at least one coronavirus case, the majority was in, were in high schools. However, in the elementary, there was one school each that had a student and separately one school each that did have a staff member. The largest cluster was in a high school where 13 staff members were working together in a cafeteria and someone who was actively symptomatic for several weeks um, was still working for reasons that are being investigated. And that was in Imperial County where the community rate is very high. Overall, the data summary, there's a lot on this slide, but let me summarize it briefly. The question really here is, so we understand that kids may be less susceptible, not impossible to get the disease, but less susceptible relative to adults at least prior to high school age. Um, there's a big question though around how infectious they are. And um, overall, some of the studies that have been nicely documented by this University of Washington review suggested that in schools, the amount of transmission conferred to a community from the school back to the community was highly dependent on which schools opened and when, and what the community rate of transmission was. Perhaps among the larger disasters was in Israel where high schools opened quickly when the community rates were above 40. Um, by contrast, in some other countries when the community rates were between five and 15, so our R rate of six and a half being right in that window, uh, very few cases to no cases of community transmission associated with the schools. And overall, uh, Goldstein and Lipsitch, Lipsitch is probably the, arguably the best infectious disease epidemiologist in the country, um, indicates that really the risk is associated with the secondary and high schools and particularly colleges with less so among primary schools. This may seem confusing because we've all read news reports suggesting that kids are as infectious or more infectious than adults. So where did those news reports come from, came from? Um, they came from two studies, one of which is depicted here in, from JAMA Pediatrics. Um, the other was a preprint unpeer review that has still not yet been published. In both cases, the authors wanted to say, um, how well using highly sensitive instruments can we detect particularly nucleic acids, particular parts of the virus among younger versus older people. And they found what you see here in these box plots is kind of a wide range of how much you can uh, detect and amplify the viral load in the nose of kids of different ages versus older, older people, adults. Um, it, unfortunately, there was an editorialist in Fortune magazine who wrote that this means that kids are more infectious than adults. At the very least, it suggests that the bulk is overlapping. Um, but more importantly, this isn't actually an indicator of infectiousness. This indicates how much you can detect viral RNA in a kid's nose if they're symptomatic with the disease. The overall infectiousness of a group of people is determined by how many are asymptomatic and what their live virus emission is, plus how many are symptomatic and how much their live virus transmission is. Among children, there's a much larger group that is asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic compared to adults. And in cell culture studies, which actually look at how much live virus there is, not as how much DNA can be detected, which could be from prior exposures, those are actually much lower, uh, the lower age range you go. And uh, similarly, because there's a smaller portion of symptomatic, the overall impact of children and infectiousness is lower for the community. Um, now that got very confused by this and the other study and in fact the authors tried to clarify that um, but it was largely an unsuccessful attempt to clarify. The other commonly confused case was from South Korea where when we talked last time we discussed the range of observations about um, infectiousness of children and the South Korea st study stood out as being unique that they found a lot of transmission from kids to adults in the same household, whereas all these other European and Asian studies did not. In fact, it turned out that a few uh, weeks later, the South Korea study was corrected when a second group reanalyzed the data. Um, and in fact, could only document carefully one case of child-child transmission. It looks like there was some serious data mishandling and the intra-household cases that had previously been attributed to children were likely actually parent to child where the parents test result had not been properly processed or attributed to the correct date of starting symptom point. 
So that's an interesting correction to what had been previously a data outlier. The other carefully done study that's happened since we last discussed was a very large study in Australia um, where they did find that um, among close contacts of six infected kids in schools, there were no secondary infections. And Australia's um, infection control procedure mimics very much what is being introduced by SFDPH, which I'll talk about in a moment. So I can recommend these overall reviews that have been done in terms of transmission clusters that have looked worldwide and also looked carefully at what is most similar to the US experience now. And essentially they concord with the idea that um, if community transmission rates are low enough, we can prevent secondary transmissions in schools, but it'll critically depend on if that community rate is low enough and if precautions of certain kind are taken in the schools. So um, here's the overall summary. This is all the stuff that we talked about last time. I won't go over these studies again, but because they were in the previous presentation, but overall suggesting the lowest risk of transmission from children less than 10 in this prior uh, MGH review. And the National Academy panel has put out a recent report kind of summarizing that overall they recommend uh, prioritizing grades K to five first and then staggered reopening of other schools following. San Francisco's Department of Public Health has set out a series of guidelines for schools and I'll describe what those are and what they imply for our kids' experience and our experience as parents. Um, they're largely based actually on the South Korean experience, which may have been among the most successful of, of reopening. Um, understandably, there will be cases of COVID uh, diagnosed after kids return to school. And it's important to level set that as community transmission still is a positive number, six and a half per 100,000, there's a risk there. In San Francisco, if we had no mitigation uh, mechanisms, you'd explain the probability of having a positive kid enter a school is about 0 0.007. So about one out of every 140. If you uh, take the mitigation methods that were introduced in South Korea and perfectly apply them in San Francisco, that cuts it to about 30% of that number. Um, so the key South Korean interventions were staggered reopening. So first elementary schools, the safest group, then middle and high school. Um, they had uh, the, a number of masking and distancing measures in place as well as disinfection, and most importantly, cohorting so that a limited number of secondary cases would have to be contact traced if there was exposure. They also offered um, and required testing of all teachers and staff, which is also going to be the case in San Francisco recommended to do the same with parents, not as much for kids because there the sensitivity is not known as well. And a negative test is not as assured in an asymptomatic kid to truly be negative. We're finding that out through the Los Angeles massive testing procedure where after about 7,000 tests, none have shown up positive. Some people misinterpreted that as good news. It actually suggests that the tests are not detecting the cases because LA has so much of a higher rate and even some of those kids were um, actually not fully asymptomatic, but truly symptomatic and highly likely to have uh, the disease. So testing uh, is really primarily detected towards those who is validated for among either symptomatic people or asymptomatic adults as the primary drivers of the infection. Here's the plan for SF school reopening and our wonderful La Escuela administrators can uh, elucidate further about some of the details that I may not know about specific classrooms and how the architecture might work. The earliest approval process will allow school reopening at September 21st or thereafter. We wouldn't anticipate any schools being permitted to open until then. The procedure is very similar to those of you who participate in the summer camp. Um, screening and entry with temperature checking and associated symptom checker that's based on a standardized validated checker um, and no non-essential visitors allowed into the actual buildings or areas. Stable cohorts, typically um, 14 or so, and physical distancing at six feet or greater as allowed. Face covering, so a cloth mask, and ventilation. So in the context of the fact that our world was bright orange not too long ago, ventilation is a hard one. Some of the schools have relied on outdoor ventilation only, but I'm glad to report that La Escuela has acquired uh, MERV-13 air purifiers, which is the same level as what you see in a surgical operating room. Those do capture coronavirus as well as other droplet and airborne viruses and all bacteria. They do also screen out the smoke and smoke subparticles that are dangerous. 
Um, this is the a question we get a lot now, which is um, the air quality and its relationship to the risk of death. So all cause mortality, particularly from heart disease, actually less so lung disease is increased by smoke inhalation. And um, these, the, if you look at the air quality indexes in the morning, the subcomponent to pay particularly attention to is this PM two and a half, which are these two and a half micron or smaller particulate matters. That's what's been most associated with an increased risk of death. And it's similar to cigarette smoke. It's about duration of exposure as well as quantity of exposure. But those who are daily exposed to elevated levels are, are obviously at a higher risk of mortality. Um, to give you a sense of the scale, I think yesterday here in Mission Bay, uh, it the PM2.5 was up at, at 70 micrograms per cubic micrometer. Thankfully, back today, it's already fallen down to about 12. But needless to say, um, having air purifiers in place is helpful rather than purely relying on outside ventilation in this context. And all staff um, will receive a, a high sensitivity COVID test uh, prior to entry. Um, the school and other schools can't require parents to test as far as I understand the law, uh, but we would strongly suggest it and I'll talk a bit about where you might be able to obtain testing since we as adults are the primary sectors of transmission. So what to expect as parents? A few key things. One is the state and county are requiring that we all sign a risk acknowledgement form. Um, this to a non-lawyer like myself reads as like a standard uh, terms of service waiver where you uh, basically say anything and all things could happen, but it's, it's required for all schools to ask the parents uh, to do this. So don't be surprised. It's not a La Scuola specific uh, type of waiver that they're introducing. It is kind of required by government authorities. So that will be received soon if you haven't received it already. Uh, cleaning and disinfection are going to be happening multiple times a day across all surfaces. Um, uh, La Scuola is using uh, organic disinfectant that is both effective against coronavirus, but also approved by EPA and others to be quite safe for, for kids and animals. The cohorts will generally be under uh, of the size of 10 to 14 uh, with spacing and ventilation in the classrooms and pretty strict occupancy limits. And what that'll imply is that a cohort of kids will enter together at a scheduled time and with staggered timing for the different cohorts and also remain together throughout the day rather than intermixing. Um, that affects the drop-off procedures, so look for further communications around timing of drop-off and some of the procedures around spacing uh, at drop-off and of course no visitors into the, into the uh, classrooms or the other school areas including parents. What to do if symptoms are exposure, I'll describe in a moment, but there are two primary communications that the government is requiring La Scuola to have. One is a communication preserving privacy of the individual who may have a positivity. But if you are in the same pod or if your kid is in the same cohort as somebody who is infected versus if you're at the school but are not in the same cohort. And those two groups are given different instructions. If exposed to a positive case, the pod is effectively shut down for two weeks to allow for the duration of the incubation period, allow for testing and return to the school after a safe period of possible infectiousness, but the other pods can remain open. Um, privacy is required, it's all under the HIPAA Privacy Act, and so the individual can't, uh, their names and so on can't be disclosed. And I'd say um, having my younger child, a one-year-old at the UCSF daycare here, where there were two positive cases, both teachers over the course of the summer, perhaps the most uh, destabilizing influence was not the school actions. Those were all strictly followed and actually very well communicated. It was unfortunately the parent community erupted into kind of a, a rumor mill. Um, and so I'd advocate for us to exhibit the good behaviors that we hope for our children and try to avoid rumor mills. This is an infectious disease and so we should destigmatize it as much as possible. Um, so in terms of the specific procedure, this is what um, the Department of Public Health has notified uh, to schools. And essentially, if, if someone has symptoms, they're going to stay home, get tested, and their cohort remains open until they know what the test results are. The Scuola has arranged uh, for the teachers and staff to have um, testing with a high sensitivity but rapid turnaround time. Uh, PCR test, um, and so some of the turnaround time problems that are exhibited elsewhere should hopefully not be the case here. 
Um, if you have close contact with someone confirmed, then you do the standard CDC quarantine, which probably all of you have become familiar with, and that cohort can remain open. But if you end up with a confirmed infection, then there's a sequence of steps. Uh, uh, an email notice and, and further notices will go out to the parents about that to identify close contacts, start the quarantine period, close that particular cohort for two weeks, enable testing, allow disinfection, and then reopening while the other cohorts remain open. So I'll be able to, uh, and, and Danny and Valentina will answer any further questions about this, but there's a very specific flowchart that will be shared so that uh, it can be remembered because there's obviously a lot of caveats and stipulations. Where to get testing in SF? It's been an incredibly frustrating process for everyone to um, see testing be so difficult to get. And for children, I've found that uh, people generally have the best experience at the Children's Hospital in Mission Bay, where you can make an appointment and get tested, and there's a number of, um, and they generally accept all insurance coverage types. An alternative is the SF Department of Health has a, contains a list of alternative testing sites, and they maintain a turnaround time index. So if you call them, um, they can indicate to you if you don't want to go to the UCSF Children's Hospital, what other testing sites might be closer in your community and actually have a rapid turnaround time. Don't attempt to call them between 12 or 1 because they take lunch break very seriously, I found. Um, for adults, uh, LabCorp Pixel would be my recommendation. I have no affiliation with LabCorp. The reason is, number one, it's easy and it's covered by all of your insurance. Number two, they've had the best turnaround time. I've found that people going to uh, CVS Minute Clinics or Walgreens or City Test SF are still experiencing frustrations with lost tests, delayed tests. It's not very useful if your test result comes back two weeks later. Um, this is FedEx overnight shipping and then the FedEx driver will come back that night in order to pick it up. It's anterior nasal, so it's not a deep, uncomfortable nasal, but it's still high sensitivity. There are others available at urgent care clinics, but I just want to note that those are some of the rapid antigen tests, which are known to have lower sensitivity. So for asymptomatic people, they may not be able to catch a person who's truly asymptomatic and infectious as well. In terms of flu season, there's a couple things to note. So um, this is the time to get a, a flu vaccine. If you got it in July and August, some people may have waning immunity and it may be a bit too early, uh, but mid to late September and October are the perfect time to get it done. And most of the larger clinical providers in the city are allowing now for drive-through uh, flu vaccination so that you can schedule that um, or just show up and walk in clinics that are spaced and have uh, appropriate COVID precautions. One thing to be careful about and to know about is that the flu symptoms essentially overlap with early COVID symptoms in, in entirely. And it, in addition, the period of infectiousness of flu and the period of infectiousness of COVID are effectively the same. Um, previously, there had been a draft of a CDC guideline that would update the COVID guidelines to handle flu, and that kind of got uh, politically killed. Um, but this is a, a portion of a table that was taken from there, which is sort of guidelines for when to return to school or work uh, in flu season once that starts up, which is generally um, highest around Jan and Feb. So the idea is if you're positive for COVID, you'll get specific instructions, you know what to do, you isolate yourself until you have a resolution of those symptoms for at least a day. Um, if you're positive for flu, about the same duration of isolation would be recommended for you. Um, but flu tests are not quite as mandatory. It's effectively getting a flu test so that you know if you, particularly in the first 72 or 48 hours, whether you might benefit from an antiviral drug that is really only effective at reducing those symptoms during that early period. Um, it doesn't particularly affect your infectiousness to others. And so still effectively being out for about 10 days um, would be recommended if it's, if you're COVID negative, but still flu positive or, or unclear about your flu status. Um, one thing important to note, so here's the height of the flu season and the optimal time for vaccination is right around now through the end of October. One thing to note, although its variability can be um, different across different clinics across the city and you can call ahead of time, there's lots of different formulations of the flu uh, vaccine. So if you're allergic to eggs, there's formulations available. If you're the type of person who got a flu vaccine in the past and you felt like you got sick, 
It's often attributable to a preservative that used to be used in the past and is no longer commonly used, and so you can ask for a preservative-free vaccine. There's even nasal sprays available at a fewer number of clinics, but, um, and perhaps most innovative, there's a special type of so-called needle-free vaccine in which the fluid is actually squirted at a very small uh, amount of microns in, in uh, less than a second, kind of traverses the skin and is also very effective. You can get any of these um, should you be afraid of needles or just feel like the previous flu vaccines were unhelpful to you, but it would be highly recommended. COVID vaccines. Um, there's so much uh, going on in terms of COVID vaccines. So let me relay what has been communicated to us. The CDC sent around a memo to um, state epidemiologic boards and so in five cities. So San Francisco is not one, among one of those cities. It's not entirely clear why they selected these five. Um, but as it was, the, they indicated that um, these entities should be prepared for two vaccines and should make the appropriate arrangements for refrigeration for these two vaccines, labeled only as vaccine A and vaccine B, but it's largely thought to be a Pfizer vaccine and a Moderna vaccine. Um, they then gave these estimates of how many doses would be available by late October and by the end of December, um, but indicated that likely the dosages would not be able to be extended across more than these prioritized populations people actively treating COVID patients or those in nursing homes, which account for about half the COVID cases in the country, essential workers, and they indicated explicitly that this has not been defined by them yet, and national security populations, which primarily means military personnel. Um, among those three vaccines, um, the Pfizer trial is anticipated to release its data uh, to the public, although it's been released internally to the Data Safety Monitoring Board um, sometime in October, and then regulatory approval will probably be shortly thereafter. It is two doses spaced a month apart. Um, and the immunogenicity is greatly improved by having both doses. Um, there is also a Moderna vaccine for which the trial is ongoing and that had uh, positive preliminary results, but we haven't seen any further results and we're not sure as much about the timeline. Um, and an AstraZeneca vaccine, which was paused briefly, although it's since been partially restarted that uh, was the case in which a person had a, a neurologic reaction that is severe, that person has recovered and is since out of the hospital, um, but that, it, that can be associated with some um, types of viral vaccines. What, what I would suggest is that uh, it would be surprising to see wide scale availability of these vaccines prior to um, well into next year. And um, I found that STAT often does a very good job of reporting these things in a comprehensible format. But this headline kind of captures what's going on. Usually there's a single body that guides vaccinations in the United States, the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, or ACIP, which is under the CDC. And unfortunately, three alternative groups have appeared um, and been promoted uh, by various meddling individuals um, and have kind of created a confusion around who has authority over COVID vaccine distribution. So we're waiting for that to be sorted, um, but unfortunately states and localities have very little authority in this regard and mass confusion seems to be the norm at this point in terms of the federal response. Um, regardless, I think the most important point for us is to that all indications of this would likely be a partially immune vaccine, that is not something that truly fully immunizes you against COVID. And that means the continued need for infection control, the continued need for testing, uh, unfortunately. It would be surprising if we weren't dealing with this uh, well into, if not throughout 2021. And so I want to level set that that's uh, kind of the anticipated reality from the epidemiology front. So not to end on a terrible note, but um, you know, for, for, I don't mean to speak for all parents, but I think for some of the parents, this lady who posts wonderful social media has uh, indicated her response to the first day of school. I think I'll be doing some, some of these gestures myself, but I wanted to end on a positive note that, that school, school is potentially coming, I hope. And I'll leave some time for questions and uh, we can proceed from there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Basu. Um, 
that was amazing. Um, we have some questions that have already started rolling in. I don't know if you're receiving a private chat, but I will uh, encourage you to look at your chat to see them. And I'm going to ask you one now. Um, we have a question uh, about that you covered deaths, but what are we finding about longer term impacts on children who get COVID? It's a great question. Thank you. Um, so there's sort of two sets of findings with regard to longer term implications for COVID infection among children. Um, the majority of children who have tested positive are thankfully recovering without accompanying sequela in terms of long term um, neurologic, cardiac, respiratory, or other um, consequences. That's about um, 90 to 93% of the kids who have gotten a prior infection. And another, uh, uh, about 7 to 8%, they have longer term, generally on the order of weeks to months, recovery times. And um, in a few cases that they have experienced complications such as cardiac anomalies that have required, for example, anticoagulants or um, other treatments for blood clots, which appear to be triggered by the virus. Again, more so in, in adults than in kids, but still in some kids. In fact, of the, of the several patients I've had in my primary care clinic who have died of COVID, um, you know, the, two of the five of my patients who have died have died of the clotting complications afterwards. Um, in a small, thankfully small proportion of kids far less than 1%, um, they do experience a profound inflammatory syndrome. And it's been increasingly studied. Um, and that syndrome can be truly debilitating, if not deadly. Um, thankfully, it is exceedingly rare. But there are, haven't been really great predictors of which subset of children have that. It's not necessarily in kids with certain underlying chronic conditions. Um, and so that remains very much under investigation. It's a very worrisome thing as a parent. The only real assurance we have is that it's thankfully exceedingly rare. So I can go through the questions if, in order, if that's okay, unless there's any other preference. That would be great, thank you. So first question is how frequently should we get our kids tested and how often should adults in the household be tested as well? So for kids, right now, the American Association of Pediatrics, along with other bodies like the Infectious Disease Society of America, don't recommend asymptomatic testing um, because we're not sure of what the sensitivity is and it looks like it's quite poor. So you might be getting false reassurance more than anything else. However, if they're symptomatic, that's totally different. And so only upon symptoms or exposure is it recommended for kids to get the testing. Uh, for adults, the primary vector of transmission who, for whom asymptomatic testing is now also uh, thought to be important in addition to testing upon symptoms or exposure. That the frequency is under debate and there's various ways of calculating it. For um, the current prevalent or incidence rate in San Francisco right now, it would be helpful um, for everyone to get a test although it cannot be required, and I can't say that it's legally required. It would be helpful for parents to get tested, uh, order a test about 10 days before school starts so that you can get it within a week of the school start. And then depending on where the incidence rate goes, if it spikes further, then retesting would be indicated uh, about once a month. If the, test, if the incidence rate continues to go where it's going as below five per 100,000, then testing could again be only upon symptoms or exposure because the likelihood of catching you in an asymptomatic period is so slim as to not make a meaningful impact on risk of outbreak. So I would suggest um, if you're in that first cohort, uh, try to order an at-home kit about 10 days beforehand, uh, get your test done about seven days, and those turnaround times have been guaranteed at less than 72 hours, so you should have your results in hand. Um, well before the beginning of the school day, the first school day. Um, another question is, can you specify the size of the cohorts? For middle school, we've been planning for no more than 18. I think, Danny, I want to check with you that I'm not saying anything incorrect, but I was thinking that most of them are around 10 to 14 sized uh, cohorts, unless there's rare exceptions to that. 
Um, we do have exceptions um, at the middle school level um, where they are slightly larger than that 14. But they're all under 18, right? Yeah. So the next question is, why are middle schools opening if age 10 and up are more vulnerable? This is a good question. It's really a matter of, of relative risk. Although the, those under 10 are thought to be the, the most safe, there's kind of a ramp up of risk over the course of middle school into high school. Um, and it's really a judgment call about when is the safest time to reopen. Uh, many of the countries that have reopened and successfully kept infections away at middle school did have a higher um, case rate in the community than, than we do now in San Francisco. So that is reassuring news, but it's not to eliminate risk entirely. Um, and it's a really, to be honest, it's a mix of uh, political pressures and realities needing to balance different kinds of risks. And every parent I understand has different conceptions of, of what they're comfortable with. I, I wish I could assure you that there was a risk-free choice here. Um, but what I think we're all struggling through is trying to balance different kinds of risks and finding what's comfortable in, in that context. Um, to me, the most perverse was college reopening. I think we were all kind of doing the epidemiologist version of screaming and shouting, which is, I guess, just uh, typing in bold or something. But we, we were trying to convince colleges not to reopen. It just seemed entirely insane to us. And a few of the local ones did choose to not reopen, but it, the level of risk just seems astronomical there. And it's very worrisome. Um, I'm much more reassured about the younger group. Um, other questions? Sounds like there's issues with false negatives in testing children. Is that why it's not part of the recommended process for school reopening? That, that's correct. Without testing kids, what's the best way for a community to detect outbreaks? Among kids, it's really, the detection of outbreaks is really reliant on symptoms or known exposures. Unfortunately, it's not um, yet, the testing landscape hasn't evolved sufficiently in order to reliably test asymptomatic kids. Um, we hope that improves in the future and there's a few technologies on the horizon, but they're so early on that they're not even in the stages of having released of valid data yet, yet alone FDA approval. So it's gonna be quite a while. I wouldn't anticipate that changing in, the, in a matter of weeks to months. Um, so unfortunately we're, we're left with cruder measures um, uh, in terms of daily symptom checking. Question, given there are so many symptoms of COVID that it could be almost anything, including a sore throat from the air quality, how should we think about that in terms of the kids' teachers needing to be tested very often? That's a great question. Um, one of the predominant um, points about the way that the symptom screener is phrased is that it's phrased in terms of new uh, symptoms that don't have an easy alternative explanation, which is uh, subject to judgment, of course. But someone with chronic lung disease, it can be harder to detect a new case of COVID. Or someone with daily migraine headaches, it could be, of course, harder to detect a new case of COVID. Um, but the intent is, do you have a change from your regular health status in the context of the air quality, I understand it's quite hard because people may be coughing for other reasons. And I'd say that it's really up to using your best judgment on, on, on the matter of safety. Um, in terms of rapid tests frequently, um, you know, the teachers are getting pretty frequent uh, testing given their degree of exposure. Among the parents, it's also uh, eligible to get rapid repeat testing. Um, and have it be covered by insurance. So that pixel link is permissible for that. Um, there are also rapid testing venues around the city. Um, some of the point of care tests that are the 15 minute ones are the lower sensitivity, but they are available while you wait. And so that can uh, still be another option. There's no perfect option with both high sensitivity and an extremely rapid turnaround time. Um, the saliva direct method that is available from Yale or another equivalent one from UCLA has not yet been licensed to commercial labs. So it's still kind of in the stage of having been discovered, but not widely available, unfortunately. Hopefully a matter of weeks to months before then. Um, you mentioned at-home kits a couple of times, but I haven't heard of resources to source those. Can you share more? Is this the Pixel or other options? So there are several options. Pixel is an at-home test. Another one is called Everly Well. 
um, and another one is picture genetics or fulgent genetics. Those are all the most common at-home kit types. Um, the reason I recommend the Pixel is that it will work for your insurance. For the others, you have to buy out of pocket and they're generally $100 to $150. And then you would submit the receipt to your insurance. And I think those of us who've been through this process know that things tend to go badly in terms of dealing with insurance companies that way. I would think it's just, it's just a bit easier to get um, the insurance process immediately on the front end and not enter your credit card and just have it be auto charged. And um, it does accept Kaiser, which is a common question. So uh, I actually have Kaiser through my wife's plan and I was able to get um, Pixel kits, no problem with full reimbursement. If you do get Kaiser, don't get scared that you get a notice afterwards. They're just, they just ask that you share your test result with your primary care provider, but they do fully uh, pay for it. But it looks like they're about to send you a bill, so don't panic. Um, if a family member travels by airplane, would a child in that family need to stay home for 14 days because of the risk of infection and in air travel? That's a good question. So um, there's the guideline-based answer, and then I'll give you a Sanjay answer. Um, so the guideline-based answer is um, no, technically not. Uh, the Sanjay-based answer is um, the risk of infection is really dependent on where you're going for how long and how packed the plane is. And so that's really hard to judge. Um, there's a really great study at MIT that quantified this and it showed that in the, in the planes where the middle seat was by policy empty, it was about one in 7,200 or so was the probability of getting an infection. And if the middle seat was full, it was about one over 4,300. It's hard to think in terms of probabilities that way. Um, but in general, it's not tremendously high and the airlines have been um, doing a good job of maintaining masking. There's also been kind of quietly in the background a change in the way that the commercial airliners have been doing ventilation so that the ventilation is no longer um, the recycled air approach that I think we're all familiar with getting infected from, from prior airline travel. So now they're actually, most of the common commercial ones are doing every three minute fresh air recycling with a, a HEPA filter, which is a lot better than, than standard. I don't know if they're going to go back to their prior approach because this approach is much more expensive, but for now um, they're doing more rapid ventilation. Based on these, let me make sure I didn't skip a question. Oh, here's the next one. Um, and I want to be cognizant of time, Danny, if you wouldn't mind interrupting me whenever you need to transition. Uh, we have time for a few more. Thank you. Okay. Uh, based on the studies, does it make sense to keep kids 10 and under on one campus versus moving third and fourth graders who are eight years old or nine year old to the mission campus? If that's a school specific one, Sanjay, we can also handle it after. Um, okay, I'll yeah. defer. And you can, so this, uh, Sanjay, this refers to the fact that three to fifth will be at the mission campus where middle schoolers are. And the way we are structuring is the two floors on this building. And so the three, third through fifth grade will be on the lower floor and middle school will be upstairs. And so they will be separate, you know, on two different floors, but in the same building with stagger uh, drop-offs and uh, separate, you know, lunch times and bathroom and so on. So, so yeah, with that in mind, yeah, just please feel free to answer. I'll, I'll defer to you on the specifics of that. What I would say is um, it's not um, a sudden development of uh, so first of all, the infectiousness doesn't suddenly increase after 10. It's more that um, risk starts to increase after 10, and it's a very gradual slope until you're in high school, um, where it's about the level of young adulthood. And then risk continues to increase um, again as you become older, uh, particularly above uh, 65. So it's, it's the infectivity, on the other hand, doesn't seem to correspond very well or perfectly to that and is also poorly understood. Um, it's just that for 10 and under, we feel very assured about lower infectivity and are being conservative about that number. So I wouldn't um, feel like your kids shouldn't hang around any 11 year olds. That's not the implication. It's more that there's this gradual increase in risk and that infectivity can be really all over the place. 
but is generally lower among kids than adults from what we understand now. There are, of course, so-called super spreaders, which are people who, for reasons that are very unclear or still very much under investigation, are incredibly infectious, and they seem like everybody else, and some of them are even asymptomatic, so it's very hard to um, really quantify infectivity quite so well. Um, if testing isn't reliable for asymptomatic children, should we be testing uh, teachers more frequently than once per month as I understand the current plan? So um, the, in terms of testing frequency, teachers are being staggered into uh, cohorts as well and then being tested every couple of weeks. So it is more frequently than a monthly basis. Um, there's also other additional kind of surveillance strategies in place for teachers. But part of this is also um, somewhat governed by the California Testing Task Force and their recommendations and requirements, and they govern some of the frequency calculations. They're trying to balance the load across laboratories um, for places that are doing better off like us versus places that are kind of off the charts at the moment but are still planning on opening schools because they can't really control the school opening plans, which are under different jurisdiction, but they can try to at least help um, distribute the testing. So unfortunately, this is a panoply of different actors uh, creating rules in a, in a system where there's not quite as much of a unified force as, as one might, might want. Um, Andre, I think we have mm -hmm. time for one more question if you have it. Okay, uh, let me see you. if there's any uh, that touches on a theme that is, is um, quite a bit different from the others so that we can... Uh, oh, here's one. Um, what qualifies as a symptom? Great question. So we'll um, share around the um, list of appropriate symptoms. And you should note that um, the phrasing is quite specific so that uh, kids with kind of the run of the mill kind of stuff are, are not just being uh, unnecessarily excluded from school, but at the same time, genuine um, symptoms that are associated with actual coronavirus infection are being thoroughly screened up to and including the rare but very specific symptoms like loss of taste and smell. Um, so the, the goal is not to um, be so adamant that uh, any kid with the, the tiniest runny nose is being excluded from school. At the same time, it's, it's also meant to actually be somewhat evidence-driven about this and as being unified across the school so that um, people are not being treated differently across different schools uh, within the same locale. So I'll end there and turn it over to you all for discussing some of the logistics. Thank you so much, Sanjay. I think on behalf of all of us, we really are so appreciative of, of everything you do for us here at La Escuela. Um, I am going to share my screen and get to some of the questions that have come in from our parent community over the past week. Uh, give me just one second here. Hopefully you will see. Okay. Can you see my screen, everybody? A nod? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we can. And if you want to put it in present mode, I don't know if that works so that you can make the image bigger. Yeah, perfect. Um, and first, I'm just going to go over verbally off of a few, um, a few questions that came up first. So you'll just see. Actually, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm going to keep it in uh, non-sharing mode until we actually start sharing uh, data. So we can answer your questions. Okay, I'm gonna go down the list here. Uh, what is the protocol if a teacher or student tests positive, does a class pod stay home for two weeks and get retested? I think this was answered by Sanjay. Um, it is also available on our reopening plans on our website. The short answer is that we work with the Department of Health on contact tracing. The individual must isolate at home for 10 days um, after first symptoms. Uh, and then the pod or the cohort will quarantine for 14 days after the last date of exposure. Uh, the pod will get a close contact advisory and the uh, campus will get a general exposure advisory. So before coming back on campus, testing will be required. Um, and again, there is no quicker return, even with testing, um, the pod in quarantine will need to wait the full 14 days. Um, have there been any COVID cases at the preschool? If so, how many? And I am very proud to say that we have had no uh, cases of COVID uh, through our summer camp as well as uh, this year so far. 
will the children be provided lunch again or will we need to pack a snack and a lunch? Uh, our partners are still to be determined. We're working uh, uh, hard on getting them in place uh, with the current timing, uh, but the intention is to be able to provide the food service that we have always provided. Stay tuned for more news on that. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is a suggestion, but finding uh, we're finding it hard to hear when, Mary, when people are wearing a mask, particularly when listening in a second language. It might be helpful to get teachers a type of headsets um, or a, another accommodation. And I, I don't know, I think Fede is on the line here, but I believe we are looking, actually Fede, I took your question. Are you here? Would you like to share? Yes, I am. Hi, <laughs> hi everyone. Yes, so we are providing with the clear mask. So that means that they're gonna be transparent, you know, in the so they can they can talk uh, with the you know with the children, and that's we we that's exactly what we try um, this past week in the pre-K, and they're working really well. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, we have increased our time outdoors um, near, to nearly double what it was before. Um, can the children please be outside more? I'll let Sally or, and or Fede take that question. I can take it, hello. Um, yeah, we will plan to have the some certain learning outside. So whether it's the garden or PE or classroom learning will be designated areas for each cohort. Thank you. Uh, will the children be permitted to use the play equipment upon return to school? Fede? Uh, oh, there you are. I'm gonna take that one. Yes, can you repeat it again? Sorry, Dan. Uh, sure, no problem. Uh, will the children be permitted to use the play equipment upon the return to school? So we, we are planning on do, uh, so there are like, um, I can uh, tell you about the uh, pre-K experience. So everybody has their own box in terms of equipment. So it's divided by cohort and by pod. So everybody, every pod has their own soccer ball and all what they need, you know, to play in the yard. For the play structure, we uh, have uh, one of our facility um, people that are cleaning the plague structure every change of the cohort. Thank you, and that will continue and the on. the same procedure will, yeah, so the same procedure will be at Pelle, right, Sally? Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. If, if I think the question really is probably referred to outdoor equipment play, but yeah, yeah. The climate structure. And exactly. So we just have to, we'll listen to more from the uh, guidance from the city and then we'll have all our cleaning procedures in place. Yep, absolutely. Uh, vale, maybe you want to take this one. So there's a question about should all families socialize only with other families within a class pod and maybe on a broader scale, can you comment on behavior expectations out of school, including play dates and sleepovers and that sort of thing? I don't, I don't know that I have full control on your private lives. I, I, I love that. That's, that's very flattering. Thank you for the question. I think, you know, we, uh, the reason why we shared the pledge with all of you uh, was that even though we know it's not a, a legally binding document, uh, we wanted to send a strong message that we are all in this together. Um, we are a community and I think if we're all behaving responsibly, um, things will be uh, well. At the same time, uh, and I think we also all have um, feeling differently at this unusual time and, and risk sometimes or perception of risk is, is unique to a family or a person or sometimes your circumstances. I mean, some of you are essential workers that will be uh, working uh, out there like us, you know, teachers are now essential workers. Um, you know, you know, myself and Fede and Sally and many of us have been here all summer. So I think those are other circumstances you should, you should keep in mind. I think if people have a, a cohort of people that they trust, and for some of you, it may be your pod, but some of you may have family in the Bay Area, many of us don't. Uh, and these are going to be people that you see, so that will inevitably expand your pod. I think being extremely careful and open to everyone you know that you take exposure very seriously 
Um, and, you know, and to me, if I think about, uh, you know, I have two adorable nephews in Italy who are uh, 21 and 23, and if they were here, probably I would stay well away from them, and knowing uh, the kind of life that they lead. Um, but I think it's within your cohort, you can certainly um, agree upon this. I think uh, it's, it's important. So we can't tell you what to do, but we would love you to take that pledge very, very seriously. One thing I'm going to bring up, even though maybe that was not in the question, but I'm sure it, it was probably, it, it will be a question at some point, and it's around traveling that came for Sanjay as well. And, and Sanjay is right in that, you know, people, air travel, I mean, some of you may have to start traveling again for work, or uh, when the winter break comes, you know, people are going to be longing to go home and see family that they haven't seen for a very long time. And so we will be thinking about more specific guidelines on potentially what airline uh you know to use or again having making sure that our winter break is long enough to ensure that people will be able to quarantine for the required time uh, before coming back and we're even considering having a time of remote teaching and learning you know before or after the winter break to make sure that we make that period even longer thank you for the question there is, um, Vale, actually a specific question that if anyone in the household does currently travel outside of California or in a plane, are they bound to quarantine at home before coming onto campus? I think the answer is, is yes. Under Unfortunately, current. yes. Yeah, this is like what's, yeah, under current guidelines, this is what Sanjay shared, yes. Thank you. Uh, what is the arrangement for extended care? And um, I can share right now because of the cohort mixing limitations, uh, we are working on all of our options, but we do not currently have a plan for extended care at the moment. Um, Sally, if there's anything you'd yeah, like to Yeah, and ask. this is a question, yeah. So this is actually, I just wanted to add, Dani, this was a question that, so, you know, as, as you know, we are all meaning, we, like all independent schools, are in communication with the health department. Um, you know, there are, you know, they're, they're, they're really trying their hardest to meet, you know, everybody's needs, which is an impossible task, of course. Um, the question about extent, around extended care came up last Friday in a meeting with them. I, I think they're also trying to figure out what is a, a safe way for parents who truly need that childcare after hours. What, what would be a safe way to have extended care? But we, we're not there yet. Thank you. Um, let's see, where will special subjects and lunch take place at the Mission Campus? Um, uh, right now I can say that lunch will take place in the classrooms and this is actually for Fell and for the Mission Campus uh, or outside, uh, but it is all staggered based on schedules. Uh, and special subjects um, uh, from specialists uh, right now are are in the scheduling is taking place right now. Uh, there is a possibility that we may have virtual specialists. I don't know, Sally or Fede, if you wanna. Um, so that's gonna vary between campuses. And again, the conversation is happening right now, of course, for the outdoor uh, specialties like environmental science and, and PE, um, they can happen outside. Mm -hmm. uh, for the other specialists, what the health, the health department recommended last Friday, they prefer us to do a push in versus pull out as they defined it. So they don't want uh, all the cohorts to go into an art room and for obvious reasons. If the specialist is going to see the children live, it would be the specialist going into their class. And of course, if you think about the pod and the cohort and them being with one teacher, you, then you may wonder, okay, but this is another adult that's gonna be in contact with them. And so the way that the health department is thinking around this, obviously thinking of a middle school situation where every teacher is a, is a specialist, is that the key thing here is that the adult is protected and protecting others, you know, because as we heard from Dr. Bazou, this is how the, the, the disease spreads. So maintaining that distance, we have, you know, already those plexiglass protecting screens and masks and all of, all of the above. Also, there will be a potential of some of them teaching remotely for a specific cohort, so there's not too much mixing. Again, this is all work in progress, and we wouldn't do anything that would not, was not blessed by our contacts at the, at the health department. Um, I'm going to get the presentation up, but there is one question about what bathroom, what the bathroom situation will look like at both Mission and Fell. Um, I think at Mission, I can answer very briefly here um, that uh, you know, as Valentina mentioned earlier, keeping the, um, the th grades three through five and grades six through eight have, will have separate bathrooms um, to use. And they, 
the scheduling will take care of a lot of the, the staggering so cohorts are going together um, to the restroom at the same time uh, as applicable. Um, and then the social distancing will be maintained um, you know, through uh, signs on the floor um, and making sure that the social distancing capacity of all common areas and classrooms actually will be significantly lower than it was before. All right, uh, let's see. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, good, okay. Timeline for reopening. Uh, Valé, do, do you wanna take this, this slide? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so as you heard um, from, from Sanjay, the, the city is obviously because of the epidemiologist data that they see and the way that things are, they're moving towards reopening schools. Um, and I think the one thing that's important to know is that as of last Friday, San Francisco is now, was now in the red zone for two weeks, which truly means that uh, even though we apply for the waiver process, uh, now every school can be on the path to reopening. So now what used to be called the waiver uh, application and request that we submitted, it was a very lengthy document and I actually want to share my gratitude to the whole team and especially to Danny for the incredible job that they did and also our COVID-19 task force from board and former board and Dr. Bazou. So uh, now uh, after all that work, <laughs> they told us that we can now turn that into a reopening plan. So every school in the city potentially can open by uh, September 21st. Um, we're gonna be doing this gradually. So we are uh, going to receive a, a, an inspection on site. So we will be visited by um, a city official that will come and check that what we describe on our plan is being implemented. This would be very similar for those of you who are familiar with it, with, uh, you know, the inspection that you will get from licensing at the preschool. So it's really like a state, you know, person that comes and checks that we have a sufficient number of desks and where, you know, we have the, the, the protection and the plexiglass protection and all of the things that we need to have signage around the school and on the floor. So the, I think the earliest that we could open K2 would be September 28th. Um, and then we would, we, again, we are staggering as recommended and then uh, mission 3-5 would be October 5th and then 6 through 8, October 13th. Um, and so, um, yeah, that, that's it. You know, so if for some reason, you know, if we get an inspection, just to give you an example, um, like at the end of this week and then we get their blessing early, uh, like mid of next week, we will still wait until the following Monday to make sure that we are, you know, we're well ready. And then there was also there's a transition for the, the cohort that uh, will stay um, online. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take this, uh, this slide with, with support from Elisa, who I think is on the line and has been uh, responsible for actually helping to set up all of our classrooms. So as far, and we'll have pictures up at some point very soon, but as far as the classroom setup, so grades K and 1 will be at tables with shields that create four sections, while only three children will be seated per table and the tables will be spaced six feet apart. Uh, grades two, three, and four are going to be seated at single desks spaced six feet apart. Each desk will have a shield of its own. And then grades five, six, seven, and eight have two students at one large desk, three inches with a shield in the middle. Uh, students and desks will face in the same direction and desks are uh, roughly six feet apart. I want to emphasize also that the teacher's desks will have their own shields and are also six feet apart in every scenario here. Movement on campus. So we've been kind of studying the movement entrances and egress as we've mentioned uh, earlier, but we rely heavily on the staggered drop off times uh, per classes. Um, we are using at FEL both the front and the side entrances for pickup and drop off. More details will be shared by, um, by Fede uh, as we get closer. And on mission, we will continue to use the Shotwell Street Gate for both uh, and, you know, uh, pickup and drop off. Clear signage uh, will be a big difference that you'll now see when coming on campus guiding students. Um, that will apply also for movement within the school, um, you know, going which staircases we're going to be used for going up and down, how much space, um, you know, reminding politely, reminding everybody to kind of stay to the right while going up and down stairs um, and making sure that, you know, there's no congregating and that sort of thing. Again, limited uh, capacity signs will be uh, up throughout all buildings. 
And testing, I think um, Dr. Bazu covered off uh, pretty well here. Uh, I don't know that there's much more to say, um, except for that we are, again, just want to reiterate that we are testing faculty and staff monthly. Everyone will be tested within seven to, uh, to 14 days of being on campus, and the monthly testing is staggered. So 50% of our workforce is tested every two weeks uh, per the recommendation. And uh, <clears throat> Dani, I want to add to that that we consulted with Dr. Bazu before we came up with the schedule, and also that this exceeds the requirements from BPH, which yes. is every two months. Perfect. Uh, the transition to short-term distance learning, this is um, a slide for to cover off on the case where a pod may need to go into short-term learning for isolation or quarantine reasons. Um, I am, um, this, this information is available on our website. Um, and if anyone has specific questions, please do reach out to us. I'm not going to, to read the slide at the moment. I'll give you a second to read it. And I think this is a continuation of the prior slide. Again, all of this information is available on our website. Uh, so just to reiterate here, uh, the timeline, uh, you know, campuses are, are busy right now where we're setting everything up. People are getting tested and uh, we are all very busy preparing for Friday's uh, Bell Street uh, visit from the San Francisco Health Department. Uh, we also added, if, in case you didn't catch it in the Bolotino, um, a couple days to our winter break to account for the days that we opened up earlier this year. So we have an extra long break, like Valentina mentioned, to um, hopefully make it so that everybody has time to visit, visit family and uh, can start making their plans now. And I think uh, we are done with the questions and answers. Um, unless anything else has come in, I will check the chat now. Feel free to, uh, to ask, ask questions if you'd like. You see, you will see like questions in the chat, guys. Okay, let me go back to our, Joel has put some questions together for us. I'm going to look there now. And let's see. How do teachers feel about starting? Fede, Sally, Vale. So that's yeah. I mean, that's it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. We are where the preschool teachers are there, <laughs> and so they've been there for a month, and and so I think we've been, um, you know, we are now qualified as essential workers. So I think uh, we all feel it's our duty to come back. I'm sure everybody feels differently. Again, everybody has different feelings about this. I mean, Danny sent out a survey, um, and I mean, if you want, Danny, you can share a uh, high level um, numbers from that survey. Um, and I'm sure like every situation is different. Um, you know, the, the, the reality is as, as the city points us towards reopening, you know, we're, we're here and not everybody's gonna feel the same way. I would say that the majority of teachers are um, happy to be back in person because for, you know, virtual learning is not necessarily ideal, especially for the younger students. But Fede, you can add to this and 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 Sally as well. Yeah. That means, yeah. Yeah. I can share. You know, I talk. Uh, you know, I we are meeting me and Sally with the teacher pretty much every day, and I feel there is a great. You know, they 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 can wait to come back. I mean, there is a, you know they're setting up the environment. There is a lot of like uh, talking to be back in person and. Uh, of course, there is, you know, some of them have also worry about, you know, the COVID-19, but I feel like uh, in terms of safety procedure and also bringing the experience of the pre-K where we have 95 children on campus and 25 teachers working, uh, the experience has been going really, really well, following all the protocol and all the procedure, you know, cohort, the, the teacher are inside with the kids wearing masks and uh, it's been going really well. Sally, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, likewise, we continue to um, talk and listen and you know, um, just work together and grow our enthusiasm. 
around um, opening the doors and supporting everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see a question about, um, let's see, the plan start and end times for each grade. I think that's, yeah. Thank you. So yeah, the meaning start time, school school day, school day for it's each grade. It sounds like it, I believe so. I think that will probably be published, but Fede, you probably, yeah, if you probably know for, if you know for K-5, we, we will need uh, Doug to answer that for middle school. Doug had a, 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 a previous family commitment, that's why I couldn't be here. I, I can answer for the K-2. I mean, we are creating a staggering time. So every 20 minutes, we have three pods that are coming on the, on the, you know, two different entrants. So that means like, we're probably going to start with the older grade. So second grade, they're going to come between 8 and 8.20. Uh, and uh, the kids will be entering, you know, in two different entrants and the teacher will be, be waiting for them outside in the yard where we create three different uh, spots. Uh, and when they're collecting all the children, they're just going to enter inside the classroom. And the 8.20 to 8.40 will be probably first grade. And 8.40 to 9 o'clock will be the kindergarten. And we will share, you know, all of this information uh, with all of you. Thank you. Um, I have a question about um, pick up and drop off uh, for older students at the mission. Um, so older kids still can arrive and leave on their own. We do need the parent to fill out the questionnaire, um, the health screening. It does need to be the parent or guardian that does that. Um, so you can work with a campus manager. We, can, we have a digital form that you are also welcome to, to fill out, but it does need to be filled out by the time the child is on campus every day, um, as well as the walk away form if, if that's uh, not something that's already been signed. Uh, let's see, regarding air quality, what is the threshold used to close the school versus leaving the kids inside? Um, so I'm gonna actually post our air quality policy right now in the chat so you can see the different thresholds. Um, we do- uh, And uh, sorry, Joel, was that on the bulletin or two? Well, I mean, did you, I think that table was in the bulletin of last Friday as well, but it's on our website as well. Yes, it is. Was it on the bulletin? Uh, it was not. Okay, yeah, so we can add it to this week's bulletin, you know, but it's on the website as well. Okay. And yeah, so the threshold, yes, if you, you'll find everything there. There's a whole table, but also like an explanation of what happens in all the different scenarios. And for, you know, like Sanjay, you know, shared for, you know, COVID versus smoke, do we open the windows, open windows so that we lower the risk exposure and then we open the windows and we get the smoke and we have the air purifiers on. So there's a combination that was recommended by the health department um, of, you know, favoring air circulation, but then also, of course, filtering the air to make sure that it's uh, um, below a certain threshold in, in the classroom. Okay. For some, also you need, I mean, I want to, I always want to remind our whole community about the fact that we all live in different homes in different places and not, and some, some of us may have better air at school than we have at home. So I think, you know, this is why for us, you know, of course you can always choose to keep your child home if you feel comfortable, but for, for some, some of you may, you may actually be more comfortable having your child in school with good um, filtered air. Uh, we have a question about the number of kids per grade that have opted, uh, signed up for the distance learning. And I'm gonna share the numbers with everybody. Uh, so for kinder, we have about five children. First grade, about five. Grade two, about seven. Grade three, roughly six. Grade four, there is one. Grade five, there are none. Uh, grade six, there are three. Grade seven, there are three. And grade eight, there is one. Okay. Um, if a teacher gets sick, non-COVID, I assume the cohort will not attend school and no backup instructors will online learning be available in that case. Faye, do you wanna take that one for the K2? Yes, I can. Um, so we are trying to um, have a group of like, um, you know, the people that will be in the school will be part of that cohort and that pod. So we are not 
having anyone external that will be entering um, in, in the school. So, but we will have a group of probably specialists and also subs that will be uh, taking over. So yes, the school is gonna happen, even if the teacher is not gonna be there. And there, there may be a situation where the teacher is, you know, in perfect, you know, is, has to quarantine, but they're healthy. And so in that case, they may be able to actually teach from home but your cohort can be a school because obviously as you know if you are a dual working family that many of you are we you know at la scuola you know your children may be here and their teacher may be remote but then there will be someone making sure that they're they're looked after so then you know then they may have not been exposed uh, okay i think we've covered everything here And we have about two minutes left. Any last minute questions uh, anybody would like to submit? Okay, and no, we are always here. Should you have specific questions, please reach out to us. Um, any of us uh, are very well equipped to answer on, on a number of, of different things. So uh, who is provider? I just wanted, yeah. Oh, sorry. I just no. wanted to, 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 to thank uh, Dr. Bazu Sanjay one last time. Uh, it, it's always such a pleasure, you know, and thank you so much for sharing your amazing, you know, knowledge and experience and, and doing so generously with your community. We know you're very busy um, at home and at work. So it really is uh, uh, much appreciated. Sorry, Dani, you had another question that came in. With one minute to spare. Yes, one minute to spare. So who is the provider of, of testing for teachers? So we are encouraging our teachers to uh, pursue a number of different pathing, uh, testing paths, including uh, what's available through Kaiser, as well as um, the color and the other vendors available through sf.gov uh, testing, as well as Pixel. So uh, we've, we have a number of options that yeah. are available. Yeah. And I was going to actually, I would like to add to that, uh, since the, you know we know that and many of you speak to uh, parents at other independent schools. There is a, a, a provider who is um, doing some very, very good marketing to independent schools. I mean, they offer a solution that is easy, very easy to implement. Uh, we don't like easy at La Scuola. So we actually, when, I, when we, we asked uh, Sanjay what he thought of that test, and it turns out that that test is not very accurate. So it would be a lot easier for us <laughs> to pick that option because, you know, Danny and I would maybe uh, we'd be having an aperitivo on Saturday instead of talking about COVID testing, uh, but actually uh, it's not very accurate. So we're not gonna go with that company that is used by a majority of independent schools. Um, and we're keeping, we're sticking to the plan and we will continue to consult with uh, Dr. Bazo to see if there's a better option and, or maybe a faster test, when the faster test becomes available and is also reliable. Absolutely, and I wanna remind everybody that you'll be able to find a copy of this presentation on our website and the reopening plans as well. So please feel yeah. free to, to look there. Yeah, and the, this meeting is being recorded. So for those of you who weren't able to attend at this time, you know, it will be, I think, placed on our website and probably will be in my update, right, Joel? Weekly update. Thank you so much for finding time to, uh, all of us, you know, educating ourselves on, on the many new things we find out every day about this disease and from being, from being part of the La Scuola community. And, you know, we, we know that many of you are excited to come back, uh, you know, whether, you know, in person or virtually. Um, I wanted to say that the funny image that Sanjay shared at the end with the, the parent jumping for joy. And the thing actually that stayed with me was the, how one of the teenage children was really embarrassed and covering his face, saying, you know, I can't believe my, my mother is posting this on social media. And so whichever way you feel, uh, we, you know, we're delighted to have you as part of La Scuola. Have a great evening.